this morning, I really want us to press in to the word that the Lord has for us this morning. I want to talk to us for a few minutes this morning on the topic of faith. If you've been going to church for any amount of time in your life, you've probably heard uh, messages preached or you know studies on this topic of faith. But today, I really want to challenge us through the word on why faith is so crucial in our walk with the Lord, okay? It's so crucial because um, the Lord did not save us to sit on a pew and come to church every single week. That's not why he saved us. He did not save us just so we can go to heaven. He saved us So we can walk on this earth with the supernatural power and authority that the Word tells us that the Lord has given us to do supernatural works here on earth, okay? Supernatural works here on earth while we are here. The hand of God, the power of God, the anointing of God, the power of the Holy Spirit is upon those people who God has chosen and we are here to do supernatural works through the power of God. I did not give my life to Jesus January 28th, 1987. We're coming up on my anniversary here, my birthday, my spiritual birthday. I did not give my life to Jesus back on January 28th, 1987 just to sit on a pew every single day and say, oh, thank God I'm going to heaven. That's not why I gave my life to him. I gave my life because I wanted to be a part of the kingdom of God. I gave my life because he gave his life for me. And when I signed up to be on the team for the kingdom of God, I said, Lord, whatever you want me to do, whatever you want me to do, that's a scary thing. When you say, Lord, whatever you want me to do, that's a scary thing because he might say, okay, well, I want you to do this. Well, I, I, didn't, I wasn't talking about that, God. <laughs> no, no, you could come... Give me something else. That's not how it goes. So uh, this morning, I, I, I really want us to press in on this topic of faith and why it's so crucial in our daily, daily walk with God. Amen? Let's pray. Grab the hand of the person next to you. Put your hand on their shoulder, whatever you want to do. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you for your presence in your house this morning. We thank you that that presence is tangible. We thank you, Lord, that you are a supernatural God. You are not limited to the natural. You are not limited to the laws of man, the laws of science. You are a supernatural God. And you've called your people to walk and serve you and operate in the supernatural as well. Lord, I ask this morning that you would just anoint the words that come out of my mouth this morning that they would be your words only, that I would not add anything to it, but I would speak only that which the Holy Spirit gives me to speak this morning. I pray, Lord, that you would make this word crystal clear to us, that it would make sense, that it would be a seed that falls on good soil in our hearts, and that it would be watered, and it would grow, and it would produce much fruit for your glory and for the kingdom of God. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have your Bibles, uh, open them up or turn them on. We're going to go to the 17th chapter of Matthew today. And I want you to, once you get it, just hold there. We're gonna, it's going to be a couple minutes before we get there, but just find that place. If you don't have your word, that's okay. We'll have it up on the, the screen this morning. But I want to start off this morning by giving you the dictionary definition of this word faith. Webster Dictionary of the word faith says complete Complete trust or confidence in someone or something. Did you hear that? Complete trust or confidence in someone or something. Now I want to take this uh, dictionary definition and then I want to give you a biblical definition that is found on this word faith, that is found in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, and it's going to be up on the screen. It says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for in the evidence of things not seen. So we have our biblical definition of the word faith. We have our dictionary uh, definition of the word faith. And somewhere in the middle they come together, 
that we have to have complete trust and confidence in someone or something, that someone or something is the Lord Jesus Christ. We have complete trust, complete confidence. That means even when it doesn't look like we thought it would look like, it, that doesn't matter. We have complete trust and confidence. Even when we pray, we've been praying daily for a situation and it looks like that situation is getting worse, we have complete trust and confidence in what the Lord is doing, okay? We understand that it is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things that we don't see, okay? We may not see it, but we are trusting in faith that even though we don't see it manifesting, we have complete trust and confidence in the Lord Jesus Christ. Are you with me this morning? So I want, we, we know that the book of Hebrews chapter 11 is commonly referred to as the faith chapter, and it gives us a lot of examples of biblical characters that by faith they stepped out and they did something and it was pleasing to the Lord. But this morning I want to make it very, very easy for us in why faith is so crucial in our walk with God and our relationship with God. I'm going to give you two reasons. These are my top two reasons. Now, we could li li listen, when you're talking about faith, you could teach on it for weeks and months and years at a time, okay? But this morning, I'm going to make it very easy, and I'm going to give you my top two reasons why faith is crucial in our day-to-day, minute-to-minute, second-to-second walk with Christ. Number one, if you're taking notes, write this down. Hebrews 11.6 tells us that without faith, it is impossible to please God. Did you catch that? Without faith, it is impossible for you and I to please God. Now, I don't know about you, but as a Christ follower, my goal is to please him. I'm not here to please you I, I do want to please my wife because, you know, I want her to be happy. I want to please my children. But my main goal in my life is to please him. And when the scripture tells me that there, without faith it is impossible to please him, that catches my eye. That tells me that faith is crucial. Because it doesn't say that without faith, you can sometimes please God. It doesn't say without faith, you know, you can uh, once, once a week. You could, no, it says without faith, it is impossible to please God. Amen. Impossible. Do you hear that word, impossible? It means it cannot happen. No way, no how, no shape, form, or fashion. It is impossible. So that, to me, my friends, is very, very important, okay? Number two, and we're going to spend some time on number two this morning. Faith is a bridge that takes us from the natural into the supernatural, and because as, as men and women of, of God and Christ followers, and I'm going to give you some biblical examples to back this up this morning, God has called you and I to operate in the supernatural. Did you hear that? God has called you and I to operate in the supernatural, and without faith, we cannot step in to the supernatural. Okay? If we lack faith... It, uh, uh, this is the analogy of, of, of a bridge. My family and I, we went on vacation this summer, and one of our stopping places was Jekyll Island. And to get onto that island, surrounded by water, you had to have some way to get to it. You were either going by boat, which we don't have, or you got on the bridge and you went over that bridge to the island. Okay, Faith is the bridge that takes us from where we stand in the natural and transports us into the supernatural, okay? Faith is the only way that can carry you from the natural to the supernatural. It is so vital and so crucial that we have that, okay? I wanna give you an example this morning, and Alicia made a uh, reference to it this morning as she was exhorting us to worship the Lord this morning. She talked about Peter and um, when he walked on water. 
And it's found in Matthew chapter 14. You don't have to turn there. I told you to go to 17. That's where we're going to start in just a few minutes. But Matthew chapter 14, and I want to read to you starting at verse um, 22. It says, immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side where, while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Whenever evening came, he was there alone, but the boat was already a considerable distance from the, bu- from the land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Dur- during the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified and said, it is a ghost, and cried out and feared, in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Now listen to what Peter says. I want you to get this. They originally believed that what they see walking on the water is a spirit, a ghost. Okay? But Jesus reassures them. He says, take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. Now listen, Peter has some faith here because he believes if in fact it is you, Jesus. That's what he says. Right? He says, Lord, if it is you, Tell me to come to you on the water. He had so much faith in Jesus that if he, w- he was saying, if that really is you, Jesus, then you tell me to come to you on the water. He had faith that Jesus was going to allow him to walk on the water. And Jesus simply said, come. His faith, his faith took him from the natural, which was standing in the boat, and propelled him to step out of the boat into the supernatural and to begin to walk on water. It was his faith in his Savior because he simply said, if it really is you, Jesus, tell me to come to you and I'll do it, all right? But we know how the story goes. Is such a, in, in the same way that the, the, that the bridge of faith took him from the natural to the supernatural, the second he began to doubt and fear, it took him from the supernatural back to the natural. It works both ways. Do you see what I'm saying? Because what did Jesus say to him when he, when he began to sink? He said, you of little faith, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Why did you look at the circumstances? Why did you look at the winds? Why did you look at the waves? Did you see this? His faith took him from the natural to the supernatural, but his lack of faith also took him from the supernatural back to the natural. You following me with this? Is that making sense? That is a clear-cut biblical example of faith working both ways, being a bridge that can carry us to the supernatural and likewise take us from the supernatural back to the natural when we lack it. Because the very reason why, G, uh, the very reason why Peter sank was because he took his eyes off Jesus, he looked at the circumstances, and his natural mind told him, this ain't good. He went from, Lord, if that's you, I trust you wholeheartedly. I will come to you on water. And he started walking on the water. And then his mind left, his eyes went off of Jesus. And he looked at the waves and the winds. And he was like, dude, this ain't normal. And he he went back. He started to lack in faith. And he went back into the natural. You following me? So very, very important that we understand that this, this faith topic It can work both ways. It can take us into the supernatural and it can take us out of the supernatural into the natural, okay? Now, this next scripture that I wanna look at this morning is super, super important for for the context of what I'm trying to get to us to understand this morning. Matthew chapter 10, verse one, it says this. He, being Jesus, called his 12 disciples to him and gave them authority. Everybody say, gave them authority. To drive out evil spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. You following me with this? This this scripture says Jesus brought his disciples together and gave them the authority to drive out evil spirits, which is supernatural, right? That is a supernatural act. We're talking about working in the spirit realm, okay? 
gave them the authority to drive out evil spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. That is a supernatural authority that Jesus gave to these men, okay? Now, I, I want you to get this for a minute. I want you to put yourself in the shoes of these disciples as Jesus called them together and said, hey, gentlemen, you're working with me. You've seen the authority that I have in the, in the spirit realm. You've seen the authority that I have over demons. You've seen the authority that I have over sickness and disease. And I now give that same authority to you. I am giving you the authority to cast out demons. I'm giving you the authority to see someone who is sick, lay hands on them, and in Jesus' name, work and operate in the supernatural. Okay? That's what he said to them. This is your authority. This is what I'm giving you. This is what I'm allowing you to do because you are my disciples. That's Matthew chapter 10, verse one. Now fast forward seven chapters to Matthew chapter 17, and we're gonna start at verse 14. When they came to the crowd, a man approached Jesus and knelt before him. Lord, have mercy on my son, he said. He has seizures and is suffering greatly. He often falls into the fire and into the water. I brought him to your disciples, but they could not heal him. Now, wait a second. Just a few chapters ago, Jesus says, I am giving you authority in me, authority to cast out demons and to heal the sick. But yet, just a few chapters ahead, this man approaches Jesus and says, my son has seizures, he's demon-possessed, and I brought him to your disciples, and they could not heal him. I want you to get what Jesus says next. He says, unbelieving and perverse generation. How long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Now, sounds to me like the disciples was getting on Jesus' nerves here, didn't it? I mean, because he, he's like, look, I've already given you this authority and here we are, you, we, someone coming to me saying, hey, I, brought, I, I, I took my son to your disciples and they couldn't do anything. Jesus says, bring the boy to me. Look at verse 18. Jesus rebuked the demon and it came out of the boy and he was healed from that moment. Now, this is important. Verse 19, the scripture tells us that the disciples came to Jesus in private and asked, why couldn't we drive it out? You understand this? Because you gotta understand how these, these disciples are thinking. They're thinking, wait a minute, this didn't work. We did what he told us. He gave us the authority to do, right? He told us we had authority to do this and we tried it and it didn't work. And they want to know why. So they come to him in private and said, hey, what gives? You told us we can do this. We tried it and it didn't work. Why could we not do this? And Jesus simply says, because you have so little faith. You see that? You could not do this because you had such little faith. He continues on to say, I tell you the truth, if you have the faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. You see, I want us to understand this this morning. Jesus had given the authority but when the opportunity came, they were unable to operate in that authority. And when they came to Jesus in private and says, why can't we do this? He says, because you have so little faith. I, 
I heard a preacher once say that most Christians have enough faith to get to heaven, but they don't have enough faith for heaven to get into them. You see, because heaven is a supernatural kingdom. It's a supernatural city, right? And, you know, it brings us back to what I was saying earlier. God did not save us just to get us into heaven. That's, I mean, yeah, he wants us to be with him in heaven, but he saved us to use us as the body of Christ And he has given us authority to operate in the supernatural. Sadly enough, I would say only a small fraction of Christ followers operate in the supernatural. Most Christ followers passionately love Jesus, passionately want to serve him, but they lack the faith to step out into the supernatural and allow the Lord to use them. They simply lack the faith to do that. How many times has the Lord or the Holy Spirit spoke to you, you saw someone on the side of the road or something, and the Lord said, reach out and lay your hand on them and pray for them for healing in Jesus' name, but we lack the faith to do it, right? See, faith will drive us from the natural and to step into the supernatural. That's what faith does. When we lack it, we will stay in the natural at all times. Now listen, here's the deal. uh, Staying in the natural is not a heaven or hell issue. It's an issue of, are we being used by our Heavenly Father the way He has given us the authority to be used and the way that He wants us to be used? That's what the issue is. Okay? Are you guys following me this morning? If you... Flip over, because we know that Matthew and Mark are synoptic in their gospel teachings. If you flip over to Mark chapter 9, we see Mark records this story uh, uh, the same but just a little different. And I've had people ask me this question before. Well, how come when you read Matthew, he records it this way and Mark records it this way? I'm going to give you my, my answer to that as working at the sheriff's office for many, many years, and sometimes I'd come to a crime scene where I had three witnesses who witnessed this crime that went down, and I sit them in my car, and I turn on the recorder, and I begin to interview them, and each one of these witnesses give me a detailed description of what they saw. Each one of them It will be close in detail, but some of them will give me greater detail than the other one. And I'm going to give you an example. Well, there was a white guy that came up, and he was wearing a blue shirt and a black baseball cap. He had a goatee. He he looked to be maybe about 6'5 and maybe about 300 pounds, and he, he came up and he pulled out a gun. And the next person to say, well, this white guy came up and went into the store and he pulled out a gun. You see, you, you see what I'm saying? Both of them are saying a white guy came in and pulled out a gun, but one of them gave me much more description of the detail. This is the same way when we're talking about the Gospels here. Mark chapter 9, he records the same story ver- starting in verse 17. A man in the crowd answered, teacher, I brought, you my, or, I brought you my son who was possessed by a spirit who has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him into the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. Oh, unbelieving generation, Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. That part of it was dead on, right? How long am I going to put up with you guys? How long, you unbelieving, perverse generation, how long am I going to have to deal with you? So they brought him. When the Spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell into the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the boy's father. Now see, Matthew doesn't record this, but Mark does. Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered, it has often thrown him in the fire or water to kill him. Listen to what the father says. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. Look at Jesus' reply. If 
you can? That's a question. If you can, Jesus said, everything is possible to him who believes. Immediately the boy's father exclaimed, this is powerful, I want you to get this. He exclaimed, I do believe, help my unbelief. You see, this boy's father basically was saying, I, I, there's a portion of me that believes, but there's also a portion of me that's struggling. Do you get that? And if we're all honest, many of us today are in the same position as this father who brought his son to Jesus. We believe, but there's a portion of, a, of our mind that tells us maybe this isn't going to happen. You following me? We got to come to the place where we're like this man, where we say, Father, I believe, but help that portion of me that doesn't believe. In other words, he was saying, make my faith stronger. Make my faith stronger. And Mark records the same thing. After Jesus heals this boy of this demon possession, they come to Jesus in, in private and says, hey, how come we couldn't cast this demon out? And Jesus replies, this kind can only come out through prayer and fasting, which through prayer and fasting, we build our faith, okay? Now, when I read this, when Jesus says, this kind can only come out through prayer and fasting, it's only logical. My brain tells me, my, this is how my brain works. This kind, well, what's this kind? What's the difference between this kind that can only come throughout, through prayer and fasting and maybe some other kind? And I believe to get that answer, you go back to the interview that Jesus had with the father of this boy. He only asked him one question. He said, how long has he been like this? And he said, since he was a boy. You see, this demon had possessed this boy for a very long time. You follow me? This demon had been in control of this boy's life for a very, very long time. And Jesus says, that kind takes prayer and fasting and it takes faith. I want to submit to you this morning that there are people that walk amongst us day by day that are possessed by demons I, yep I said it they're possessed by demons these demons manifest themselves through these people that many people see and believe it to just be a physical ailment or a personality issue or something like that I've said this before we have people and and before I say that, let me just preface this. I am not against medication. I wholeheartedly believe that there are physical things, the way that our bodies work, that medication can be a good thing. But let me tell you something. There are people that have spiritual issues that are affecting them physically, and they are being prescribed medication for something, and a medication will never, ever, ever heal what is a spiritual problem. Okay? What they need is... They need to have deliverance. They need to have uh, contact with somebody who has enough discernment to see in the supernatural That's the, and, and has enough, once they see it, has enough faith to say, today is your day. Today, the Son of Man who lives inside of me is going to encounter you and is going to deliver you and set you free. Many years ago, as I was Many years ago when I was a youth pastor, full-time uh, youth pastor, we would have youth camps every single year. And uh, I'd been going down, I, at the time I was a licensed ordained minister in a certain denomination, and our denomination headquarters for the state was down in a small little podunk town called Wyamama. It's in Florida, it's a little south of Tampa, and every summer we would have youth camps there. And... Uh, I would go down there um, for the junior high and the senior high youth camps. And we would have powerful worship services. And um, I was a young man. I was probably 26 years old, somewhere around there. And we were at this, this worship service at night, hundreds, five, 600 students in this worship service, people down in the altar praying. And I'm standing next to this young man, and he immediately begins to manifest demonic behavior. 
caught my eye immediately. I said, okay, something ain't right. This dude, this dude has got something internally going on that is not physical. This is a spiritual issue. And you got to understand, this is a, a type of youth camp where everybody, before they can come down there and work, they are vetted. They do background checks. You just don't walk on that campground. And I've been working at this campground for years. I knew all the youth pastors. I knew all the leaders. And there was several of us, uh, I'd say about six of us, that took this boy and we walked him back behind the stage in a closed door area to, to, to deal with this demon. There was a man there that I'd never seen before. He'd never been a youth leader there. He'd never been a camp uh, person there before. To this day, I don't know how he got onto this campus. He walked in and was sitting in this service. And we began to pray for this boy, and he was thrashing around, going crazy. And this man stepped up, and he looked this boy in the eye, and he said, you tell me right now in the name of Jesus who you are. And that demon spoke through him and said, I am anguish. That's what he said. He said, I am anguish. And this boy was thrashing around, and we were holding it. We were holding his arms. He was just flailing around. And this guy looked at us and said, let his arms go. I'm telling you what I saw. You don't have to believe it. I'm just telling you what I saw. He said, he said let his arms go. And we looked at him like he was nuts. If we let this guy go, he's going to go crazy. We let him go. And he said, angel, hold his arms. Boom. Both of the arms went up like this. And he opened up his word. And he said, anguish, you look at this. You look at this. And this kid just started going nuts. It wasn't the kid. It was the demon living inside of him. And he said, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I command you to come out of this kid and never come back in him again. And we felt a rush come out of his body and he dropped to the ground. And when that kid stood up, his entire countenance had changed. I was like, whoa. This dude turned around, the guy that prayed over him, started walking out of the building. I said, ah, ah, up, oh, you ain't going nowhere, Cletus. Come on over here. So I started talking with this guy. I'd been, I'd, I'd been in church for a long time. I've, I've prayed for people who were demon-possessed. I've seen people have demons cast out of them. I've casted out demons out of people before in the past, but there was something about this guy. I said, you, I said man, sit, sit down, pull up a chair, right? You ever been around someone you thought, man, I need to pick this person's brain? You know what he told me? He says, when I was sitting in that service, I was scanning the crowd, scanning the crowd. And this young man that had, was demon-possessed, his name was Josh. And he said, I was scanning, 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 and I came to Josh, and I locked eyes with him. And the second I locked eyes with him, that demon, when he saw me, knew that tonight he was coming out of that kid. Something tells me that this man had a discernment, but not only just a discernment, he had a measure of faith to operate in the supernatural. That faith, the faith that he had, the demon recognized it as he locked eyes with him. And he knew that this was the last night he was going to possess that temple. That's faith. And what happened during this encounter was a supernatural encounter. You cannot deal naturally with the supernatural. You can't. The supernatural does not obey the laws of the natural, okay? We have to have enough faith in us to be able to step into the supernatural. That's the reason why, listen, that's the reason why so many people are walking around demon-possessed is because we don't have enough Christ followers that have a measure of faith to step into the supernatural and operate in it. Do you understand what I'm saying? If we took a poll here today, and we lined you all up and we injected you with truth serum, you're going to tell the truth no matter what, right? Every single one of us, I would be willing to bet if I was a betting man, which I'm not, 
Every single one of us in here, at some time or another, we have heard the voice of the Holy Spirit urge us to step out and do something that was supernatural, but we did not have the measure of faith within us to do it. Okay? Now, if we recognize that, what we need to do is we need to become like this father in Mark chapter 9 where he recorded it. Father, I do believe. Help my unbelief. Give me a measure of faith. Fill me up with enough faith that I can operate in the supernatural in the way that you have given me the authority to do so. You hear what I'm saying? Now, listen, this is important because I also believe I also believe that there are times and situations where God's plan over, can override, I, 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 just follow me with this for a minute, okay? Can override our faith, okay? I had a brother who passed away when he was 24 years old from cancer. June 29th, 1998, he went home to be with the Lord. At that particular time, I was a youth pastor, and we had thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people praying for his healing. Strong, strong, strong measures of faith all around. I was sitting in his hospital room one night about a month before he went home to be with the Lord. It was just me and him, no one else. And I was praying over his body as he was hooked up to this machine. And as I was praying over him, the Holy Spirit said to me, worship me for I am the God who heals your brother. And I put my hands up in the air and I began to worship and praise God and thank him for the healing of his body. I had a young man that was in my youth group at the time. I was uh, Eric and I were working in a church down in Lakeland. And he had went to the Brownsville Revival. How many of you guys remember the Brownsville Revival was going on? And he came back and, and, and he, this young man was just, he, he knew um, uh, I had preached that Sunday morning and we had come down to the point where the doctors wanted to take him off of his machine and said that he, he you know, uh, it's time. And this young man came up to me and he was shaking. The Holy Spirit was on him. It, this, was, this was the Holy Spirit. This was not some other, you know, other spirit. This was the Holy Spirit. And he had a prayer cloth that people had anointed and prayed over. And he says, uh, Pastor, please, please, when you get to your brother in the hospital, please take this prayer cloth and put it on him for healing. I'm talking about just great measures of faith. And when we got to the hospital, I took that prayer cloth and I lifted up his hospital gown and I slid it and I laid it right on top of his chest and just, just prayed. But the Lord chose to heal him another way, okay? I'm giving you this story because I, I, I don't want you to always think it's a lack of faith when God's plan calls for something else. Do you understand what I'm saying? Is that making sense? But many times it is our lack of faith that keeps us from stepping into the supernatural. John chapter 14 and verse 12, Jesus says, Very truly I say, or I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, which are what? Supernatural works. They will do even greater things than these. My version says, he who has faith in me. I'm not sure what version we're using here, but mine says, he who has faith in me in me, will do the works that I have been doing and even greater. I've heard Galen say 
before that faith is like a muscle. The more you use it, the stronger it gets. But in the same way, the less you use it, the weaker it gets. My son and I went to the gym to work out the other night, and he was whimpering and whining and crying because he got on the bench press, and he was struggling. The ball bar was all crooked and moving, and, and, and what he used to be able to do 20 reps of, he could only do like six reps, and he was, he was, he was done. He was shot. And he was mad. He was ticked. I said, like, dude, what do you expect? You ain't bench pressed in three months. The less you do it, the weaker you get, Right? It's no different in faith. If we walk around with, 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 no, with just enough faith to believe that God has saved us and we're on our way to heaven, yeah, that's good, but is that what God wants? No. He wants us to be spirit-filled, faith-filled, women and men filled with the Holy Spirit, walking in the supernatural, waiting for the Holy Spirit to stop us in our tracks and say, This, my friend, is a place where I've brought you. This is an appointment that I've set out before you right now. Have your way. Do what the Lord is telling you to do. You following me? It's 11.55. I've been struggling in my spirit the last couple of days. And I've been asking the Holy Spirit to give me direction. I've prayed and asked God the last couple of days to speak to me and ask or give me direction on sharing with you something that the Lord has shown me through a dream. I had a dream a couple of nights ago And I documented it descriptively on a piece of paper, two pieces of paper. And when I documented it, I sent it to a few people and asked them to pray over it and and asked them to give me their thoughts on this dream. And I had no desire or plan to share this with the body. But after a day, I began to pray. I said, Lord, if, if you want me to share this, I will. And, and um, I'm conflicted in my spirit a little bit because I don't want anybody to hear this. My wife will tell me sometimes, and please, I, I want to say this in humility, but my wife will tell me sometimes that the vision that God downloads to you when you spit it out immediately it overwhelms the people does that make sense she says you've got to be careful 
doing that. That's not to say that I'm more spiritual than anybody in this room because that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying the, my wife, who knows me very well and who is my partner, she's like, the Lord will download something to you and you immediately spit it out to the body and it's overwhelming because the body sees where we are right now and sees what, what God is showing you and it, it, it can be very, very overwhelming. Am I making sense? But I feel like, I feel like that, that the Lord does want me to share this dream because I feel like that it's a, cha- it's a challenge for all of us in here because where the Lord is going to take his body is going to require each one of us to rise up in our faith and step up and be the people that God has called us to be because the Lord has a calling for his body not just here, but he has a calling for his body everywhere. And I wholeheartedly believe that we are living in the last days. I wholeheartedly believe that we do not have a lot of time. I, whole, I wholeheartedly believe that every second that we have is precious in the kingdom of God. And that we've got to be doing everything that we can for the kingdom of God. Do you hear what I'm saying? Alicia, can you come up and play? Because if, if you don't, I, I'll just keep talking. Now, I'm not going to, I, I hope that I'm not going to put a, a whole lot of time into this, but I just want to tell you that in my relationship with the Lord, the Lord has always spoke to me through dreams. This church, this building, this body that you see today, the Lord spoke that to me in a dream several years ago. If you've heard that story, you know what I'm talking about, okay? For those of you who know me intimately, you know that my desire is is not to build a mega church with some great big building and a lot of people Because to me, that's not success. That's not success. My desire and the desire of the leadership of this church, which next month on the 24th, we are going to be unveiling a new structure a new plurality of leadership of this body. You hear what I'm saying? The American church mainly is, each church is, is built on the giftings and the talents of the leader, the one, the one person, and that's, that's not what we want to be. But next month, the 25th, will be two years that this church has been in existence in this building. Since we've moved into this building, over the last three years, the Lord has given me three dreams. The first one, I was walking through a constructed sanctuary of a building. It was very nice. I saw no people in it at all. But in the dream, I had knowledge that the the building that I was standing in was second chance. A couple of months ago, I had another dream. And, And in this dream, I saw the outside of a metal building that was constructed. It was one building and I, and I could see that it was second chance. And then as I looked again, I saw another building connected to it that said apostolic center on it. I saw no people, just buildings. I want to read to you this dream that I had the other night. 
Last night during the early hours of the morning, I had what I believe to be a prophetic dream concerning the future of Second Chance Church. During the dream, I was led by the Holy Spirit and observed the campus of a church and a church service in progress. It was clear knowledge to me I was observing Second Chance Church campus in the future. As I walked around the campus and observed the service in progress, I was praying in tongues. As I prayed in tongues, I had a vision of the current campus of Second Chance Church and the people who currently attend. I then was brought back to the campus in my dream, and as I continued to pray in tongues, I was overwhelmed with all God had done to bring the church to the point I was seeing in my dream. The following is a detailed description of what I observed. The dream began with me observing a service in progress. I was not sure of what day of the service was on, whether it was Sunday or another day. However, the service was not in our current facility. The shape of the inside of the building was that of a baseball field, and the stage was where home plate would be. On the stage, I observed multiple people worshiping and singing. The people on the stage were black, white, Hispanic, Asian, and Mideastern. The building had a balcony which was located in the outfield position of the baseball field. The balcony was full of many people, black, white, Hispanic, Asian, and Mideastern, as was the main floor of the building. They were all worshiping the Lord together and the Spirit of the Lord was moving mightily. The next thing I observed was at the altar. There was a white woman who appeared to be in her mid-twenties and had very blonde hair and it was braided. She was manifesting demonic behavior and slithering on the floor like a snake. There were people surrounding her, casting the demons out of her, and she received healing and deliverance. The next thing I observed was I was walking outside of the church building, and there was a large outdoor courtyard slash pavilion. It was concrete on the floor and had a large overhang. There were many people walking around, and it was very busy. I observed another building separate from the sanctuary that was next door, next to the outdoor courtyard. In this building, there were people being trained to pray for the sick, trained to cast out demons and take the gospel to this last generation. This building was also full of people and was very busy. Many people training those to use their giftings for the kingdom of God. There were people walking around the courtyard talking and praying for one another and it was very busy as well. As I observed all of this, all I could do was pray in tongues. I did not hear any word spoke to me, nor did I, nor did any person in this dream speak to me. All I did was pray in tongues as I was carried around the facility by the Holy Spirit. It was very clear knowledge to me in the dream I was observing the active ministry of Second Chance Church in the future. I was in awe of the power of God moving on the people. It was a training place for people to operate in the supernatural. From there, I was brought back into the sanctuary in the middle of an active worship service, and I was standing on the stage. I had notes with a message prepared to preach on the topic of faith is the bridge that will take us from the natural to the supernatural. However, the Holy Spirit was moving so strongly, I did not feel it was time to begin preaching. I continued to stand on the stage and observe the power of God fall on the people. I then awoke from the dream. The elders and the leadership of this church have no desire to build a mega church that impresses man by numbers or facilities. But the elders and the leadership of this church has a passion to train, teach, equip people to operate in the supernatural and in the power of God to make every second until the Lord Jesus comes back count. It is very clear to me as I observe this dream that there's going to be supernatural training going on. Teaching men and women, boys and girls to operate in faith, to cast out demons, to heal the sick, 
to take the gospels to the generations and all over the earth in these last days. Now, you, we can look around this building this morning and we can be greatly overcome by this because we can look around and say, look how small we are. But Jesus took 12 individuals and he poured into them and he gave them the authority. The same authority that he's given you and I. And from 12 individuals, the church began to grow. Do you remember on the day of Pentecost when Peter stood up among the people who were mocking and he boldly under the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit said, this is that that the prophet Joel prophesied about. In my last days, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy And that when he boldly stood up and proclaimed the gospel, a couple thousand people got saved that day under the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. God is looking for a group of people that will say, I believe, help my unbelief, raise my faith, build my faith up in me. that will be a body that is chasing after him in these last days. You hear what I'm saying? We don't have to have the resources because our father owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He has the resources. All we have to do is be ready and prepared and position ourselves to walk in that which God has called us to walk in, individually and corporately as a body. And to do that, it is going to require a great measure of faith. And we have great biblical examples here today of what lack of faith will result in and what having faith will result in. If this overwhelms you today, I apologize. And I want to make it very clear to each and every one of you sitting in this room today that the elders and the leadership and the, the, the ministry leaders that God is raising up in this body, we have no desire whatsoever to have thousands and thousands of people so people can just say oh look how successful they are because numbers do not equal success I'm going to say something completely 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 not politically correct and you hear what I'm saying I believe that there are churches out there that have thousands and thousands and thousands of people come into church and one day the rapture is gonna take place and thousands and thousands and thousands of people are gonna show up the next Sunday. Do you hear what I'm saying? Because in America, we have come to the place where we have watered down and neutered the gospel with this mega, 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 mega mercy that we can do and live however we want and I'm getting on to a whole new subject. And I, and, and I, don't want you to, I don't want you to think that I'm judging people or ministries. I'm just, just it, this is what the Bible tells us. In the last days, there will be people who will, who will follow doctrines taught by demons. They will be misled. Even the elect. I didn't write it. That's what the Bible says. As a body this morning, I want us to come in agreement. 
not for a beautiful building, not for a beautiful training center that will equip and train people, but I want us to come together in agreement as a body for a measure of faith. That we'll be guided daily to operate in the supernatural as the Lord leads. I'm gonna say this, I'm gonna finish. I don't believe that there's a demon on every corner and every person that has a problem is demon possessed. And I'm definitely not one of these people who is just, you know, just overwhelmingly super spiritual, all that other stuff. But I am a person who wholeheartedly, passionately wants to serve God. And I believe that there are times throughout my day that the Holy Spirit stops me dead in my tracks and speaks to me. Not all the time, but it happens. There's plenty of times I miss it because I'm not locked into what the Holy Spirit wants to do. That's why I want us to be a people who will pray to to have intimacy with Christ, to have that measure of faith. So when the Holy Spirit does speak to us, we're ready. Does that make sense? Stand with me, please. It doesn't matter if you're 80 or eight in this building. God wants to use each one of us. So, I want to ask in closing this morning, if you need healing in your body, I know there were some people that that said that they needed healing. Um, I want our folks that, that pray for healing, I want you to come down. Come on down. If you need healing in your body this morning, there are people down here at this altar that will pray for you. This morning, if you are seeking a greater measure of faith, I want to ask that you will find an altar somewhere, whether it's at your chair or down here at the, at the church or on the floor, wherever, it doesn't matter. Find an altar somewhere and ask the Lord to increase your faith, bring you to the place where our faith is ready, that we're, we're ready to step into whatever God calls us to do. Amen? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close in prayer, and then we can proceed. If you need healing, start coming down. Make an altar wherever you are. Father, in the name of Jesus, we submit ourselves to you. Jesus, we recognize you as the head of the church, and we submit ourselves to you. Today, Lord, we ask that you would help our unbelief, that you would produce a greater measure of faith within your sons and your daughters, that we will be so in tune to the Holy Spirit and what the Holy Spirit wants for us each day, that our steps would be guided, our thoughts would be guided, our words and our actions would be guided by the Holy Spirit, And that we would have the faith to step into the supernatural and to operate in the authority that you've given us to operate in. Lord, we ask that you would take your body and your church wherever you want it to go, that you would provide the resources, that you would provide the teachers, the trainers, the leaders, the apostolic leaders, the, the, the mentors, the disciplers, Lord, you have provided all of that. Have your way. Help us to be good stewards of what we have now and not wait for other resources, but to begin to do that what you've called us to do now and not wait for tomorrow. In Jesus' name.